I'm going to talk about airframe, which is a lightweight building blocks for Scala. Um, let me explain a little bit about me. So he knows me, but <laughs> you probably don't know about me. So I'm an engineer at ARM Treasure Data. Um, a unique point about me is I have research background on database system, and I was doing genome science when I was working as an academia for a while. And after that, I moved to my, my assisted my career to the engineer and my joint treasure data, which was a startup company and recently acquired about ARM. ARM is a chip design maker. And I'm now leading query engine team inside ARM treasure data. Uh, I'm an active OSS developer. Um, I'm going to talk about FM today. And I also built SQL, SQLite JDBC, which already has collected, collected more than 1,000 data stores. Um, and I'm developed, I developed Snappy Java, which is used inside Spark as a compression library. So if you have ever used Spark, probably you are using my code somewhere. And I also uh, Publish SVT stone type plugin, which is used more than by more than yes, two thousand or three thousand project in kind of Scala project. So yeah, that's it. So today I'm going to talk about Airframe. So you can access this repository at Vibret Airframe, uh, which is a lightweight building box for Scala. And actually, this is a collection of lightweight module that can be used for building any types of application. Um, this is all production ready. I've be, we've been using this for more than two years. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's okay to use as a, compared to the other <laughs> talks we yeah, have today. But um, Airframe is actually based on my code collection since 2009, which is initially written Java, but I graduated migrate to all the code base to Scala because I yeah, found writing Scala. So um, we packaged everything into eblade.airframe module in 2016. And uh, this is for maintainability because we need to release a lot of cross-built binaries for Scala 2.11, 2.12. So there are many modules inside Airframe. Currently, it has 18 modules uh, that can be useful for simplifying your data spiral programming. Uh, here is a list of yeah, airframe modules. So airframe config, you can read configuration, for example, written in YAML file. Airframe launcher is a just a simple command line program launcher library. And there are many useful libraries, including object serialization, and also for debugging your application, the logging library, metrics library, JMX monitoring library. So there are many things. The, today's main topic is about dependency injection. You can you also build HTTP server by using Airframe. Finagle-based HTTP server implementation is already included. So, but before jumping into dependency injection, I want to show some of the yeah, modules that, is, that are useful for debugging your application. For example, Airframe log is simplifying your application logging. You just need to extend log support thread, which is defined in Airframe. Then after that, if you write info, something, warning, something, you can see this kind of colorful log. Um, additional good thing about this is you can see the source code location without no performance overhead, because these login codes are generated at compile time by using Scala macros. And you can find more details in my blog post on Medium. Uh, another thing is Airframe Launcher. So you, you usually need to write a startup script of your application. But you need to pass several command line options. Uh, Airframe Launcher simplifies this process. For example, you can create a class that has several option parameters, help message options, or if you want to build a server, you may need to specify port number. This option can be specified like this command line. Then command line is translated into class fun uh, functional arguments. So then you can, you can automatically bind these data types into uh, just a string into command line function argument. 
Uh, so if you need to debug remote JVM process, you usually need to use JMX. Uh, so for example, by adding this, this kind of annotation, you can monitor the internal state of the program, your program by using, for example, J console. Then you can touch the, to the remote JVM process, and you can check the internal state just by adding this annotation. You can also use Datadog. Datadog has a nice tool for periodically checking JMX metrics. So you can dump metrics every minute or every 30 seconds or so to create a beautiful dashboard. Uh, FA metrics, this is another module. Uh, it provides human readable data format, including time duration, data size. Yeah. And also, the nice thing about this module is it contains reactive time window string. For example, if you, for stream data processing, you usually need to specify some time range, for example, last minutes or last five minutes, last day or last week. But specifying exact date is a little bit uh, annoying. So you usually need to specify reactive time range beginning from now to last day or last week or last seven days. So by providing this kind of string representation time window, you can generate an exact time range like this. So yeah, this is the main topic. I think I have plenty of time. <laughs> and if you have any question, please feel free to interrupt the conversation. Um, today's goal is learning how to use FM dependency injection. Um, as a bonus, I want to make sure you are going you understand what can be simplified with the dependence injection. Um, I'm going to present five typical design patterns by using FM dependence injection. That is really helpful to improve the thought process or while you are coding Scala. And actually, there are many, many articles about dependency injection. For example, uh, one of the famous ones is written by Martin Fowler, Inversion Control. And there many, you can find many articles in Stack Overflow, Wikipedia. And we also have many dependency injection frameworks, something like Spring, Google Juice, Caldi, Macwire, Grafter, Well, there are too many frameworks. So and yeah, some people also propose no framework approaches, just using pure Scala code to perform dependency injection. So actually, the it's current situation is kind of quite confusing. You have too many, too much information, but you still cannot understand what is the DI. <laughs> um, recently, Adam Wasky wrote a really nice article to explain what is dependency injection. It tried to simplify the definition of the and it tried to provide a definition of dependency injection, but dependency injection is a process of creating static stateless graph of service object where its service is parameterized by its dependency. I don't <laughs> make sense about, uh, in this phrase. If you read this article carefully, probably you can understand what he means, but it's quite difficult to understand what is DEI. So we need to switch our thought process because of Rather than to trying to understand what is DI, we should think about what can be simplified by using DI. Um, so I'm going to show that by explaining how to use airframe, then what can be simplified by using airframe. So the usage of airframe is quite simple. Just you need to import reboot airframe package. Then for you need to write this kind of code. If your trade application requires X, Y, and Z, then you simply need to bind this object. Um, to change the actual implementation, you can define a design. Design, for example, if you want to specify the concrete instance to X, you can use bind X to instance something. If you want to make Y as a singleton, yeah, you can just specify two singleton. Uh, if you want to switch the implementation of Z, you can specify that, like that. Then what you need to do is, from the design, building the building a concrete instance of application. Then you can use application. So that's, that's it. So 
you only need to learn three steps, bind, design, and build. That's all. But by using these simple patterns, we, we can, yeah, we've found many, many useful uh, sort of design patterns in using airframe. So pattern zero is just, is just a basic, but there are many patterns. I'm going to explain all this uh, one by one. First, a basic is in FM, you can use two types of, uh, two ways of building objects. One is constructor injection, and second is intuit injection. So constructor injection is just like a regular Scala classes. So if you have an um, application that has app config objects, then you can like this kind of thing. Uh, if you want to use trait in your application, just bind the configuration like this. And how to build my, your application is the same for both constructor injection and intuit injection. So just create a new design and bind in some configuration, then just build it. So what can be simplified by using this pattern? Actually, if the previous example was a really simple one, but in real world, you need to build a lot of, lot of complex objects. For example, you think about two classes like A and B, which are going to use database client and some fluent reloader, which is an object logging library. <laughs> uh, if you have a database, you may want to have connection pool and actual database service. And if you are starting up some database, you also want to have some monitor, monitoring process of the database. <laughs> but when writing the logic around A and B, you only need to care, about, usually need to care about direct dependencies. So these are indirect dependencies. You usually don't need to, should not care about. <laughs> these complex details of your application. So by using airframe, you can focus on only this part. Because airframe bind syntax allows you just inject necessary interface to your service. So for implementing A, you only need to DB client interface and fluent loader interface. In implementing B, you only need to care about fluent client. But actual implementation is like this. There are many, many complex details can be hidden. Uh, if you don't use any framework, probably you need to write this kind of complex object nesting and uh, overwriting. So <coughs> the upper one is an example without using airframe, uh, lower part is when you use airframe. So, <coughs> the, the many, so to define a database service A, which uses database client, fluent D client, probably you need to pass some configuration to the connection to database connection configuration, but you also need to care about the initialization order of configuration because for example, when creating a database monitor instances, there's no guarantee that the database connect configuration is initialized here. So probably you need to use a lazy variable or something to yeah, delay the initialization. But if you use that airframe, you can simplify, you can hide uh, this complexity behind the scene. So that is one of the advantages of using airframe. And also another tricky thing in building application is you usually want to configure individual modules. For example, if you have an HTTP client, you also want to configure HTTP client, for example, how many connections we're going to use, how many, uh, how long the timeout is. So this kind of configuration will be necessary. And when using <coughs> database, you also need to specify database configuration host name, port name, credentials of using database, connection pool also need to configure to use, uh, to specify the size of connection pools. But if you need to pass this configuration, you need to write this kind of complex uh, nested initialization call. So 
actually, when writing A and B, you don't need to care about, you don't want to care about these nested object construction. So, by using FM, you can forget about how to construct object because FM constructs object on your behalf. So that is, yeah, one of the advantages. And so I'm going to show you some of the design pattern we found in FM. In FM, adding configuration of your module is quite straightforward. Because if you define a connection pool service, you can immediately define your configuration here. Because you don't need to think about how to pass this configuration object. For example, conf connection pool configuration is over there. <laughs> but in writing A and B, there's no connection pool configuration should not appear <laughs> in the code. <laughs> so actually, this looks quite simple, but it's not natural in, in, in reality. So by using bind, then let airframe pass the configuration on behalf of you, you can simplify uh, the thought process when you write in this kind of code. So you can put the configuration really closest press in the code. So that is one of the advantages. Another thing is you usually want to test uh, the uh, code by switching, for example, database implementation into in-memory database, or you, if you don't want to make any network connection, probably you just use in-memory logging implementation instead of using HTTP connection. So to switch this kind of implementation, you can simply need to tweak the design of airframe. For example, based on the previous design, you, you only need to switch database implementation to some in-memory implementation, or HTTP client implementation can be just an in-memory logger or something. Then how to use A is the same. You don't need to care about differences between object construction for testing or production. You just you, you can just override some of the dependency when test, writing test code. Another thing, another good thing about Airframe is you can manage life cycle of object or services at quite a ease. Airframe supports on start or on shutdown life cycle hooks. So when creating a connection pool, you want to start the connection pool. When finishing the application, you want to close the connection pool properly. Um, you can also use <coughs> JSL 250 annotation, something like this, post construct predestined, which is also used in Google Goose, Google Juice. Yeah, both ways works uh, for initializing or terminating services. Uh, what is good about this is in the real world, the initialization and termination order is quite complex. <coughs> so for example, when building this kind of application, database needs to be initialized first. Then we are going to start database monitor um, after that, we are going to start connection to database client and service A. So the order of in initialization is, yeah, usually deep nested leaf child instance it should be the first. Then, yeah, application is who are actually using these components will be the last one. <laughs> then FA manage this kind of order by looking at on start shutdown, on, on start life cycle hook. So if this is called, the, the instance is yeah, registered in this order. And when closing FM sessions, on shutdown hook will be called, um, but the order is the reverse of the initialization. So it's basically first in, last out order, final order. So <laughs> that means when finishing the application that use A and B, so if B is terminating, you, you can't close this fluent deliver yet because this is also used by A. So you need to wait, A is finished. After A finishes, you can close this. 
And by following that, uh, you may want to close the database, but DB monitor is still using that. So you need to wait for a while until. <laughs> so the dis managing this kind of dependency order, lifecycle management order is quite complex. So it actually forms the DAG, direct acyclic graph. So, but airframe builds the object on your behalf. So it can track uh, the order of object initialization. So you don't need to care about these orders. Airframe takes care of that. So that is quite interesting thing about airframe. And another interesting pattern we found in airframe is you can mix in scar traits. Uh, for example, you can define database client service like this. You can define friendly client service like this. Then you can mix in by using scar traits functionality to build a complex application. So if you want to use, yeah, so this application want to access database and friendly logger, then simply you can mix, reuse the service trait. You can also use constructor injection, but it has some yeah, duplication of yeah, renaming. You need to apply some variable names here, but you can reuse existing names by if you define a service trait. So I name, named it as a flower bundle pattern because you are going to combine various types of services by using mixing of SCAR. This pattern is also quite useful. Uh, if you add life through cycle management hooks here, you can reuse that database opening, database closing can be reused. So you don't need to define the same logic again and again. Another pattern is if you want to create, for example, multiple database connection, but the configuration is slightly different, but you want to share the same data connection pool, then you only want to configure some specific uh, configuration of database. So you can create, instead of binding database directly, you can bind the factory for building database. So in this syntax, database configuration can be changed later, like this. So if you want to connect, connect to database one or database two, you can simply call that factory generated by airframe. So these five patterns are important things in uh, using airframe. So in summary, there are basically three things you can forget when using Airframe. You can forget how to build service objects. So complex object uh, instantiation process can be simplified by just using bind design build process. Uh, how to manage resource cycle, which should be file order, yeah, can, will be managed by Airframe. And also, FM, using FM is quite simple, so you, you are going to forget how to use the use the itself. So you don't need to read many, many articles around database dependency injection. If you want to, if you read Spring DI's, Spring Boot, Spring Boot's DI, you need to look, look 10 page or more documents <laughs> to understand what is, what are they doing. So, simple uses. Yeah, you, it's quite an important part. So yeah, you can forget three things. How to be a service object, how to manage this complex file order, and uh, using the it set. So you st yeah, we still have some time, so I want to show some of the internals. By default, Airframe uses singleton binding, because most of people want to use singleton by default. Singleton is not a global singleton. It's a closed inside a session. So if you discard a session, singleton object will be also discarded. So it's sort of safe singleton in airframe. Uh, bind instance instance is when you need to build object every time. So it, if you don't want to create a singleton, you can use this syntax. Bind factory, I, also, I already explained that. Uh, design object that specify how to, what kind of instances should be used inside the yeah, objects uh, in, in binding. 
is actually design object is immutable and serializable. So for example, if you are using Spark, you can send design to remote worker node. Then you can repeat the same object construction process. Uh, you can add many, many designs to override previous designs. So adding order is quite important in EFM. Uh, so you, if you want to initialize a lot of service at once, yeah, you can, you can use production mode. Uh, if you want to file, yeah, if you want to, if you don't want to show some of the lifecycle logging, you can hide some of the logging as well. Um, actually, the internals of session build code is quite complex. So the first line of the code, session.build square app is extended this code like code like this by using scala macros so actually it try to embed a session object inside trait a then inside trait a if there is a bind a syntax yeah <coughs> it try to find the session from session folder then this session manage singleton was create life cycles of the objects. <coughs> so yeah, it's, it's quite complex, but so, but the design philosophy of FM is, I want to try this kind of complexity as much as possible. Uh, this watch yeah, is a good uh, similar example. Yeah. This one is, this watch is called Simplicity, uh, which is made by Philip Dufour, a very fam legendary, famous legendary watchmaker in Switzerland. Um, every part of the clock is built by himself. But the so look and feel is quite simple, but internals is quite, quite complex. But in, for users, you don't need to care about these details. How watch is built, <laughs> it doesn't matter for when, when writing, when using watch. So FM is actually tried to do the similar thing, providing simplicity for application developers. That is the philosophy of design. And also, another trick used inside FM is using Scala signature inside. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have this um, kind of class, uh, if you use Java compiler, you will, because of type ledger, you don't know what the element type of this, this list. But if you use Scala C, Scala C embeds Scala signature inside your class bytecode, so you can find concrete types of the list element. In this case, that is B. FM is using this uh, Scala SIG to instantiate. Even you have, for example, generic type traits. If you use Java, Java C, you can't instantiate B because there's no information about B. But if you use the yes, <coughs> signature, you can instantiate object of B. Uh, so because we, so we also support type alias, tag type, or higher candidate type, which is B, which is useful for tagless final patterns. Uh, future work and summary is <coughs> kind of version of FM is 0 0.73 uh, as of this month. We already had 40 plus releases. Uh, mostly, there will be almost no API change, just the minor fixes. Um, the reason we are having so many frequent updates is LFM has 18 modules. We need to add a lot of functionality to other modules rather than the dependency injection. And so we are also building Airframe for SCAR 2.11, 2.12, 2.30, and SCAR JS is also supported by Airframe. <laughs> but when I was using SBT with this command, the li single, single list took three hours because we need to build 18 modules for <laughs> each SCAR compiler version and also SCAR JS. Now, I gave up using SBT with this plugin. Um, just paralyze it was testing for SCAR 12, 2.11, 2.12, 2.13. Uh, you have one more? Okay. Then <coughs> we can now release, uh, release in 10 minutes by using Travis CR. Uh, for details, you can find my blog post on the Medium. 
three tips for maintaining scar project. Sirasan made similar talk, five tips for <laughs> keep maintaining scar project like this. <laughs> so yeah, okay, that's it. Summary is to understand DI, you need to think about what you can simplify by using DI. How to build object, how to manage resource man uh, life cycle orders, how to use DI framework itself. Uh, yeah, we explain these design patterns by using airframe. Thank you, that's it. Um, don't forget at GitHub's life if you are interested in. Thank you. So, Thank you.